We're going live, and so I know we're already live. So this is the second part of the daily Bible, uh, daily bread Bible reading with light Bible study. Uh, basically, I just use this channel to be like Christ, where he does basically an overview and how each chapter applies to us, which I really like this guy and the way he does this. So that's where the light Bible study comes in. And plus, while we're going through it, if there's something that uh, God puts on my heart to add that I've learned or that he's telling me to say, I'll add it. Um, but only if I know that it's right and it's true um, and that I know it's from God, of course. Um, I'll try to get through this quickly because I have like, hey, the world's worst headache, I swear, right now. And I'm just so tired. I'm, I'm always so tired. I don't know why I'm always so tired. Anyway, seems like all I do is complain. I apologize. I'm usually not like that. Romans 12, 9 through 18. And I did pray before the, the uh, first reading, but I do ask, Father God, that you bless the reading of your word. And always, always we're asking for knowledge and understanding, Father. And let it bless those that read it with us and those that get in your word and have a relationship and, and have a desire to seek your face. We pray this in Jesus' name, Lord. Romans 12, 9 through 18. In many of Paul's letters, he follows a simple pattern. He begins with a section of doctrine or teaching. He, I swear I read this already. This looks so familiar. Did I do the wrong one again? No. No, I didn't. I'm just... I swear it seems like I already read this. He begins with a section of doctrine or teaching, then finishes with a section of application. We see this in Ephesians where chapters 1 through 3 provide doctrine, what we believe, and chapters 4 through 6 offer practical ideas for living out that truth, how we behave. In Romans chapters 1 through 11, Chapters 1 through 11 offer a robust defense and explanation of the gospel of God's grace. And chapters 12 through 16 provide application for living gospel-based lives. I know why it sounds familiar. Romans 12, 9 through 18 is a classic example of this practical. And I wasn't ready for it. Counsel. It's not worthy that most of this counsel pertains to how we treat one another as humans, both inside and outside the family of faith. For we live out the gospel in relationship with others. And this was written by Bill Crowder. Romans 12, 9 through 18. Behave like a Christian. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. In honor, giving preference to one another. Not lagging in diligence. Fervent in spirit. Serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope. Patient in tribulation. Continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice, and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. For love's sake is the name of the inside story for today. Running a marathon is about pushing yourself physically and mentally. For one high school runner, however, competing in a cross-country race is all about pushing someone else. In every practice and meet, 14-year-old Susan Bergman pushes older brother Jeffrey in his wheelchair. When Jeffrey was 22 months old, he went into cardiac arrest, uh -huh. leaving him with severe brain damage and cerebral palsy. Oh. Today, Susan sacrifices personal running goals so Jeffrey might compete with her. What love and sacrifice uh, is, that is. The Apostle Paul had love and sacrifice in mind when he encouraged his readers to be devoted to one another, Romans 12.10. He knew that the believers in Rome were struggling with jealousy, anger, and sharp disagreements. So he encouraged them to let divine love rule their hearts. This kind of love, rooted in Christ's love, would fight for the highest possible good of others. It would be sincere, and it would lead to, lead to generous sharing. Dang it, Debbie. Those who, 
Those who love this way are eager to consider others more worthy of honor than themselves. As believers in Jesus, we're running a race of love while helping others finish the race too. Though it can be difficult, it brings honor to Jesus. So for love's sake, let's rely on him to empower us to love and serve others. And that was written by Marvin Williams. So if we reflect, reflect and pray, what does it mean for you to love others as God loves them? And how does Jesus reveal that love? How, how does Jesus reveal that love is more than emotion? God of love, for love's sake and your glory, help us to consider others before we consider ourselves. Amen. <laughs> it's so tiny. I even tried making it bigger. Nah. Okay, Doc. Okay, so we already kind of know the when and where. When is when God delivered the Israelites from slavery. This is Exodus 21. In approximately 1491, we see the events of Exodus 21 took place three months after the Hebrews left Egypt. Uh, where uh, the con this uh, conversation is between God and Moses happened on Mount Sinai. The characters are God. We know who God is. The Lord appeared on Mount Sinai in chapter 19 in Exodus 21. God spoke with Moses on the mountain and gave him his law for the nation of Israel. Moses is a Hebrew who grew up in the house of Pharaoh. He fled Egypt in Exodus 2 and went to live in Midian. God called him back to Egypt to deliver the Israelites from slavery. In this outline, the rights of slaves and slave owners in verses 1 through 11, Hebrew slaves were to serve their masters six years and then given their freedom. Wow. All the way back in Exodus, they had slaves. Imagine that. Then to this day, people still have slaves. If a slave loved his master and wanted to continue working for him after six years, the master was to pierce the slave's ear at the door of the house, and the slave would remain in the master's service for life. If an Israelite man bought a female slave, seemingly with the intention of marrying her, and she displeased him, he was to allow her to be redeemed by another Hebrew man, but she was not to be sold to a foreigner. If he bought the slave girl for his son, he was to treat her as a daughter. If a man married a slave girl and then married another wife, he wasn't to treat his first wife poorly or neglect her. If he refused to keep these conditions, the woman was to be set free. Laws pertaining to violence and abuse. This is verses 12 through 32. And I guess I just spaced off that part of it. Or it's on the next page because it uh, there's the map of where they were. <laughs> Here we go. Um, okay. Interesting, interesting. So 12 through 32. These verses contain God's law for how the Israelites were to deal with violent crimes, accidental harm done to another person, and violence done by animals. God laid out the judicial consequences for those who murdered, accidentally killed someone, those who struck or cursed their parents, masters who hit their slaves, men who injured one another in a fight, men who struck pregnant women, and animals, owners whose animals harmed other people. In some cases, the punishments vary depending on the extent of the victim's injuries. Hold on, i got to turn this window unit off. It gets too hot upstairs, but it's actually cold in here now. <sighs> okay. Uh, laws regarding restitution for animals, verses 33 through 36. If a man dug a pit and didn't cover it and an animal fell into the pit and died, the man who dug the pit was required to pay the owner for the animal. If one man's ox killed another man's ox, the live ox was to be sold and the money divided between the two men. If the ox was accustomed to goring other oxen, the man who owned the violent ox was required to pay full price for the ox his ox killed. Application. This chapter shows that God values life inside the womb as much as life outside the womb. In verses 22 and 23, it prescribes the punishment for a man who hits a pregnant woman and causes her to give birth prematurely. If, a, if, a, if the child was born without harm, the violator would only pay a fine. But if the child died, the violator was killed, life for life. 
Notice if a man caused a premature baby to die, his punishment was the same as if he murdered the person. There's no question that destroying the life of an unborn baby is against the will of God. Absolutely, because it's murder. We do not have the right to take life. Only God, God can create the life. He can take the life. Okay. Exodus 21, the law concerning servants. Now, these are the judgments which, you'll, which you shall set before them. If you buy a Hebrew servant, he shall serve six years, and in the seventh he shall go out free and pay nothing. I'm sorry, I forgot to grab my water. My mouth's already going dry. So where? Ah, the water. So, so sleepy. Okay. If he comes in by himself, he shall go out by himself. If he comes in married, then his wife shall go out with him. If his master has given him a wife and she has borne him sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall be her masters, and he shall go out by himself. But if the servant plainly says, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go out free, then his master shall bring him to the judges. He shall also bring him to the door or to the doorpost, and his master shall pierce his ear with an awl, and he shall serve him forever. I don't even want to know what an awl is, because that just sounds very painful. If a, and if a man sells his daughter to be a female slave, she shall not go out as the male slaves do. If she does not please her master, she, who has betrothed her to himself, then he shall let her be redeemed. He shall have no right to sell her to a foreign people, since he has dealt deceitfully with her. And if he has betrothed her to his son, he shall deal with her according to the custom of daughters. If he takes another wife, he shall not diminish her food, her clothing, and her marriage rights. And if he does not do, any, do these three for her, then she shall go out free without paying money. The law concerning violence. He who strikes a man so that he dies will surely be put to death. However, if he did not lie in wait, but God delivered him into his hand, then I will appoint for you a place where he may flee. But if a man acts with premeditation against his neighbor to kill him by treachery, you shall take him from my altar then that he may die. And he who strikes his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. He who kidnaps a man and sells him, or if he is found in his hand, shall surely be put to death. And he who curses his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. If men contend with each other, and one strikes the other with a stone or with his fist, and he does not die, but is confined to his bed, if he rises again and walks about outside with his staff, then he who struck him shall be acquitted. He shall only pay for the loss of his time and shall provide for him to be thoroughly healed. But if a man beats his male or female servant with a rod so that he dies under his hand, he shall surely be punished. Notwithstanding, if he remains alive a day or two, he shall not be punished, for he is his property. So wrong. <laughs> wow. So, so if, as long as he doesn't die, it's okay because he's his property. Jeez Louise. If men fight and hurt a woman with child so that she gives birth prematurely, yet no harm follows, he shall surely be punished accordingly as the woman's husband imposes on him, and he shall pay as the judges determine. But if any harm follows, then you shall give life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. If a man strikes the eye of his male or female servant and destroys it, he shall let him go free for the sake oops, of his eye. And if he knocks out the tooth of his male or female servant, he shall let him go free for the sake of his tooth. Huh. I got some eye drops in. My eyes are dry. If an ox gores a man or a woman to death, then the ox shall surely be stoned, and its flesh shall not be eaten. But the owner of the ox shall be acquitted. But if the ox tended to thrust with its horn in times past, and it has been made known to his owner, and he has not kept it confined so that it has killed ma a man or a woman, the ox shall be stoned, and its owner also shall be put to death. Dang. 
guess I misunderstood that in the outline. Okay. If there is imposed on him a sum of money, then he shall pay to redeem his life, whatever is imposed on him. Whether it has gored a son or gored a daughter, according to this judgment, it shall be done to him. If the ox gores a male or female servant, he shall give to their master thirty shekels of silver, and the ox shall be stoned. If a man opens a pit, or if a man digs a pit and does not cover it, and an ox or a donkey falls in it, the owner of the pit shall make it good. He shall give money to their owner, but the dead animal shall be his. If one man's ox hurts another's so that it dies, then they shall sell the live ox and divide the money from it, and the dead ox shall also they shall also divide. Or if it was known that the ox tended to thrust the time past, and his owner has not kept it confined, he shall surely pay ox for ox, and the dead animal shall be his own. Okay. And then for Exodus 22 in the outline, it says it's still the same when, where, and characters. Same, same, same. Okay, in the outline, laws and punishments for theft and accidental damage, verses 1 through 15. This chapter is a continuation of God's conversation with Moses on Mount Sinai. God was communicating his laws for the Israelite nation. If a man stole an animal and was caught, he was to pay anywhere between two to five times the value of the item stolen. If a man's animals grazed in another man's field, the owner of the animals was to repay what was eaten with the best of his own field or vineyard. A man who suspected his neighbor of stealing from him could bring him before God and God would, re would reveal if any crime had been committed. If a man was entrusted to care for his neighbor's animal but it was killed by wild beast, no restitution was required. If a man borrowed an animal and it died or was injured without the owner being present, the borrower was required to pay for the animal. If the owner was present, no payment needed to be made. If, the, if a rented animal died or was injured, the renter was not required to pay. Laws related to social justice and worship, verses 16 through 31. If a man slept with a virgin, he was to marry her. If her father refused to give her to him, he was still required to pay the bride price. Sorcery, sexual relations with animals, ill, and idol worship was punishable by death. Mistreating widows and orphans was strongly forbidden. A Hebrew was not to charge interest to another Hebrew when loaning money. If a man borrowed his neighbor's cloak, he, it was to be returned by sundown. Offerings to God were to be made promptly, and the firstborn of animals and men were to be dedicated to the Lord. The Israelites were to be consecrated to the Lord. In the application, God has always cared for the less fortunate and the poor. In verse 22, it includes one of many commands in the Old Testament that required the Israelites to treat widows and orphans well. These commands are repeated in the New Testament with James calling care for orphans and widows pure and undefiled religion. What is your relationship with the less fortunate? Does your faith lead you into the service of these kinds of people? If not, why not? How can you be more involved in helping the people who need it most? Well, there's lots of ways. You can volunteer down at the Jesus House or the Mission you can volunteer, be a volunteer down there. Um, the church I used to attend every year, every winter, they have a like a coat ministry where they gather coats and blankets and jackets and you know those little hot hands and gloves and hats and scarves and all these things, and they hand them out to the homeless. Sure do. That's awesome. Exodus 22, responsibility for property. If a man steals an ox or a sheep and slaughters it or sells it, he shall restore five oxen for an ox and four sheep for a sheep. If the thief is found breaking in and he is struck so that he dies, there shall be no guilt for his bloodshed. If the sun has risen on him, there shall be guilt for his bloodshed. He should make full restitution if he has nothing. Then he shall be sold for his theft. If the theft is certainly found alive in his hand, whether it is an ox or donkey or sheep, he shall restore double. If a man causes a field or vineyard to be grazed and lets loose his animal and it feeds in another man's field, he shall make restitution from the best of his own field and the best of his own vineyard. If fire breaks out and catches in thorns, so that stacked grain, standing grain, or the field is consumed, he who kindled the fire shall surely make restitution. 
If a man delivers to his neighbor money or articles to keep, and it is stolen out of the man's house, if the thief is found, he shall pay double. If the thief is not found, then the master of the house shall be brought to the judges to see whether he has to has put his hand into his neighbor's goods. For any kind of trespass, whether it concerns an ox, a donkey, a sheep, or clothing, or for any kind of lost thing, which another claims to be his, the cause of both parties shall come before the judges, and whomever the judges condemn shall pay double to his neighbor. If a man delivers to his neighbor a donkey, an ox, a sheep, or any animal to keep, and it dies, is hurt, or driven away, no one seeing it, then an oath of the Lord shall be between them both, that he has not put his hand into his neighbor's goods, and the owner of it shall accept that, and he shall not make it good. But if, in fact, it is stolen from him, he shall make restitution to the owner of it. If it is torn to pieces by a beast, then he shall bring it as evidence, and he shall not make good that what was torn. And if a man borrows anything from his neighbor, and it becomes injured or dies, the owner of it not being with it, he shall surely make it good. If the owner was with it, he shall not make it good. If it was hired, it came for its hire. Moral and ceremonial principles. If a man entices a virgin who is not betrothed and lies with her, he shall surely pay the bride price for her to be his wife. If her father utterly refuses to give her to him, he shall pay the bride price of virgins. You shall not permit a sorceress to live. Whoever lies with an animal shall surely be put to death. Gross. He who sacrifices to any god, except to the Lord, that is gross, except to the Lord only, he shall be utterly destroyed. You shall neither mistreat a stranger nor oppress him, for you are strangers in the land of Egypt. You shall not afflict any widow or fatherless child. If you afflict them in any way, and they cry out, they cry at all to me, I will surely hear their cry, and my wrath will become hot. And I will kill you with the word, I mean with the sword. Your wives shall be widows and your children fatherless. Sorry, my bottle of water was in the way. I couldn't see the word. What are these things? Ah. Uh. If you lend money to any of my people who are poor among you, you shall not be like a money lender to him. You shall not charge him interest. If you ever take your neighbor's garment as a pledge, you shall return it to him before the sun goes down. For that is his only covering. It is his garment for his skin. What shall he sleep in? It will be that when he cries to me, I will hear, for I am gracious. You shall not revile God nor curse the ruler of your people. Okay, I'll quit calling our president. Let's go, Brandon. <sighs> You shall not delay to offer the first of your ripe produce and your juices, the firstborn of your sons you shall give to me. Likewise, you shall do with your oxen and your sheep. It shall be with its mother seven days, and on the eighth day you shall give it to me. Oh, I don't like that. And you shall be holy men to me. You shall, you shall not eat meat torn by beasts in the field. You shall throw it to the dogs. Oh, okay, so this is Matthew 19. Matthew, uh, Matthew, <laughs> marriage and divorce. Wow, that's a trip because Pastor Ken was preaching and uh, um, uh, yeah, First Corinthians 7 verses 8 through 24 today on marriage. Interesting. Now it came to pass when Jesus had finished these sayings that he departed from Galilee and came to the region of Judea beyond the Jordan, and great multitudes followed him, and he healed them there. The Pharisees also came to him, testing him, and saying to him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? And he answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two but one flesh. Therefore what God has joined together, let not man separate. 
They said to him, Why then did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and to put her away? He said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, and marries another, commits adultery. And whoever marries her who is divorced, commits adultery. His disciples said to him, if such is the case of the man with his wife, it is better not to marry. Jesus teaches on celibacy. He said to them, all cannot accept this saying, and only those to whom it has been given. For there are eunuchs who were born thus from their mother's womb, and there are eunuchs who were made eunuchs by men. And there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He who is able to accept it, let him accept it. Jesus blesses little children. Then little children were brought to him that he might put his hands on them and pray. But the disciples rebuked them. But Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not forbid them. For of such is the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and departed from there. Meh. Jesus counsels the rich young ruler. Now behold, one came and said to him, Good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? So he said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. He said to him, Which ones? Jesus said, You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness. Honor your mother and your father, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, All these I have kept from my youth. What shall I, What do I still lack? Jesus said to him, If you want to be perfect, go, sell what you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. With God all things are possible. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Assuredly, I say to you that it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And again, I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. When his disciples heard it, they were greatly astonished, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said to them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Then Peter answered and said to him, See, we have left all and followed you, therefore what shall we have? So Jesus said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, that in the regeneration, when the Son of Man sits on the throne of his glory, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. Okay, it looks like that is the end of our reading for today. I hope you have a blessed rest of your day, all six minutes of it. Now that Jesus loves you, and I love you, and shalom, shalom.